before we start filming, if we can, this whole room, it's just to sort of think about. All right. Um, can I run? Um, do a little bit. Right. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming along. It's very much on. appreciated. Uh, my name is Andy Mycock, I'm the chair of the uh, Democracy Commission set up by Kirby's Council. Um, the council have rightly set up the commission at a very interesting time, obviously, this summer. Um, has produced uh, a politicisation society like many of us could not imagine even a year ago. Uh, obviously, ongoing uh, regional devolution has uh, begun to change the constitutional architecture, not only of the United Kingdom, but also of England. And in many ways, one of the things which has been uh, overlooked in some senses has been the impact on um, local government on local democracy. And in many ways, Kirkley's Council is responding um, to very uh, local issues around citizen engagement, political participation, and the changing role of the council in terms of all these various uh, reforms at both the national and local level. Um, but also thinking about the way in which um, local councils operate in terms of their governance. And mm. your, uh, um, your kind appearance today in front of the um, commission is very much going to be focusing on that sense of that change. Um, the, so far, we've been um, consulting with the public across Kirklees over uh, the summer. Um, we've been carrying on conducting uh, stakeholder evidence gathering uh, over the past month. We should finish some time in October, and then we will go away and uh, consider the evidence withdrawn. Um, just to start off, I'd like to introduce my fellow uh, commissioners this morning. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Good morning, then. Uh, I'm Councillor Firth uh, from Dewsbury and obviously a member of the Commission. You're very welcome here today. Thank you. Gemma Wilson, Councillor for the Lindley Ward and member of the Commission as well. Anna Marchington, one of the councillors for the Gavka Ward. Just to start off, um, it is a very simple question um, which um, it's thinking about this notion of executive decision making. There has been a narrative which has suggested that what we've seen at a national level is increasingly being realised at a local level as well. That we're seeing um, executive decision making, meaning that uh, most councillors are uh, not involved in decision making and policy making. Um, I suspect the two questions is to what extent do you agree with that analysis? And secondly, if you do agree with that analysis, what do you think can be done to change that situation? Um, well, I'm not sure I do agree with that analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look at uh, you know the, the, the formal legal way that the legal cabinet system works, then then yes, fewer councillors are involved in the formal act of decision making, and that that's undeniable. However, um, scrutiny and other mechanisms for member discussion, uh, mm -hmm. formally and informally within the council, do provide mechanisms. Uh, where councils choose to put them in place for councils to be actively involved in policy development. Uh, the extent to which those work are based, uh, I suppose, the extent to which they succeed um, uh, reflects, I suppose, more on the culture of the authority, the behaviours, attitudes and values of people in deci informal decision-making responsibility and how willing they are to open out um, policy development, decision-making to a wider group of members. There's nothing intrinsic within the leader cabinet system as it's formally set out that prevents that from happening. Mm. To what extent do you think that the, the model allows for variance that means in some circumstances mm. the situation is that backbench councillors are considered to be voting for mm. their own little more? Yeah. Uh, that it provides room for enormous amounts of variance. Um, so, if you look around the country, uh, it, obviously there are three main basic legal governance options that councils mm. can choose from. But within that, there's an enormous amount of difference between how different councils choose to operate those systems. So there are councils that, under the leading cabinet, that operate using surprisingly consensual approaches to uh, policy development and decision making. Uh, some of those are, I suppose, ones that you might describe as being hybrids between the leader cabinet and the committee system mm. model. Uh, so where uh, decisions are discussed in depth in committees, uh, which are sometimes called policy development groups, sometimes called overview scrutiny committees, sometimes called cabinet advisory committees or similar, um, even though uh, the formal legal decision happens at cabinet, uh, those committees and those groups of councillors have significant input into what those decisions are. 
um, in other councils who see scrutiny in a more traditional way still having a direct and significant impact on the development of policy. And uh, increasingly, uh, we are seeing more councils trying to retool their scrutiny functions to direct the scrutiny function towards focusing on those areas where uh, of most community importance, that are most likely to cause contention or controversy in the urban community, that are most likely potentially to cause political contention, in order to enable the council to build an element of political capital behind those decisions when they come to be made, so bring more members into the decision to make the decision-making process more robust. And I think that's, that's a very sensible uh, um, approach to be taken. I think the difficulty is that too few councils being prepared to think about scrutiny in that context. In many, um, uh, I suppose, a lack of resource, a lack of time and commitment is leading to scrutiny still being seen in a very traditional sense, still being seen as something to keep backbench members busy, and uh, power and control is still vested very, very strongly in the hands of a nine or ten uh, member executive, or to a to, to a slightly greater extent within the majority group, uh, which will have its sort of private group meetings uh, once every couple of weeks to discuss these kinds of things, um, you know, essentially secretly. Hmm. Do, do you see that one model um, out of those different hybrid models that have mm-hmm. emerged to be particularly successful? Well, it's very difficult to talk about it in, in, in those kinds of terms because there's a risk that you start becoming too pejorative. So, mm-hmm. as I've said, so much of it rests on the personalities and attitudes of the individuals involved in individual councils, mm. how willing they're prepared to be to open out decision making, how willing they're prepared to be to be consensual. And that, that's not just the majority party in the leadership, it's also the opposition and, and backbench members, how willing they are to, to, to act and, and behave constructively. Where the, I suppose, political safety valves are. Um, and it's very difficult to draw conclusions on a national basis that would enable you to say there is one particular model that works best, there's one particular structural approach that works best. Mm. A, a model that looks like it works fantastically in Authority X may be disastrous in Authority Y because there's something about the organisation, there's something about the political culture within that authority within mm. the area that would mean that it wouldn't work in a different council. Mm. So something, something that's got something to do with political balance, but there's also much more intangible stuff. It's very, very difficult to kind of say here are the particular aspects of the political culture here that mean that this worked, but this doesn't work. Um, so it, it, it's, it places a great onus on councillors and, I suppose, people within the community at local level to say, what are the approaches towards decision-making? What are the approaches towards democracy that will work here? You can't just transpose one approach, uh, one archetypal, you know, ideal political science type solution that looks like it's theoretically good onto a particular council or particular structure and say, there we go, let's run with that, that's going to be perfect. As if political scientists would well, ever <laughs> impose no, no, such, such a... The, yes, the idea. idea. So, so, so what you're saying is, is that finding the right model is, is, is a process of acknowledging the political heritage of a particular mm. local authority, the political culture that actually is in with it, embedded within the institution, and in many ways the the personal and political dynamics which affect the way in which the council and councils operate. Yeah, that's very helpful. Council. Yeah, um, obviously one of the things we're exploring is the potential to, to the committee system. Um, um, a few of us went down to um, Kingston, London Borough of Kingston, mm. to actually where they did that quite early on. Um, and one of the things that they were suggesting was that um, it didn't necessarily speed up decision making, but actually backbench councils got a lot more information and would be able to much more. Would I mean, you just care to comment on that or other uh, about that? And uh, yeah, no. I mean, um, when you obviously, but by by definition, I suppose, when you're making decisions in committee, there's a requirement that. Uh, councillors on those committees making decisions have access to a wider range of information than would yeah. sometimes be the case under the cabinet. However, of course, under the cabinet, you could design systems to ensure that councillors have access to information, have an influence, have an impact. So, uh, again, there's no structural reason why you couldn't do that under the cabinet, I suppose. The, the interesting thing about, um, about governance change is that the, the act of change itself, because it forces you to sit down and say, what do we want? What do we want our system to look like? How do we want our system to work? It, it kind of forces you, when, when in, in the change system, to put in place other mechanisms, which may not necessarily be tied to that governance option, that allow you to 
think differently about democracy and, and governance. And that's why we're very keen uh, as an organisation to encourage councils to say, uh, even if you, you're, you're, this isn't predicated on the basis of saying we're going to look at governance change, sit back and reflect on how you make decisions, how democracy works, in very much the way that you're doing. And even if that doesn't lead to a formal governance change, what it will do is that reflection will cause you to think about wider issues around democracy, wider issues about decision making in the community, that will provoke changes even if you're yeah. not making a formal legal change to your government systems. But even if you're doing that, it's still it's the culture, potentially the culture yeah. of the council. All, all comes back. All comes back. It makes it work or not. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, that, that, that sort of historical element, the sort of, like, the sort of teleological sort of development of political culture in the council is often overlooked in some senses, at central government, particularly in the way that they have approached local government modernisation. Going, thinking back to the committee system, you know, what do you think were the strengths and weaknesses of that system? Um, again, risk of being pejorative, of course, but... Uh, if, if, if I were to be pejorative, um, uh, I suppose it, it allows more councillors to be involved in the formal act of decision making. If that floats your boat, then obviously that's great. I, I, I personally am not sold on hmm. the direct need for councillors to be involved in the legal act of decision making all the time. I think you know, the wider policy development sort of thing doesn't necessarily mean that you need that. Hmm. I think that. Um, um, it can, um, I suppose, it, it, it encourages a more um, uh, formal and reliable approach to business planning and decision making within the authority. I'll explain what I mean by that. I think under the, under the cabinet, cabinet system, it's easy to be a little bit sloppy with the way that you plan and make decisions because individual cabinet member decision making certainly gives you a lot of flexibility and, and wriggle room in terms of when decisions go on the forward plan, when they go out to cabinet, when they get made. Under the committee system, because you're much more closely tied to the committee cycle, because, you're much, because the act of decision making requires that you, know, you brief, you inform, you get feedback from members before decisions go up. It means that as a senior officer trying to push a decision through, you've got to think much more carefully about the way that you engage and involve councillors within that process. And it means that your forward planning, your business planning systems, have to be much more clearly focused and defined in terms of how they work. Now again, there are lots of councils um, who work in leader cabinet that do have those very clear, stable and formal systems for developing and then pushing decisions through. But I think potentially on the leader cabinet it makes it easy for you. I should have turned that off. Apologies. It makes it um, uh, potentially um, uh, leader cabinet makes it potentially easy for you to, as I said, to be more sloppy with the way that you um, undertake those processes. Uh, but again, that's me being quite pejorative about it. It's not not guaranteed. In terms of others, I suppose in terms of, sort of cons. Um, you know, we talk a lot about consensus under the committee system. It doesn't always have to be like that. Mm. Uh, see, the thing is that the people who, if people under the leader cabinets are inclined to be, you know, dictatorial or directive in their approach as cabinet members, under the committee system, as committee chairs, they've got mm. the same approach. You'll get whipped votes. You'll get decisions forced through. You'll get debate and discussion in committee, but it will be fundamentally meaningless because the votes only ever going to go one way. So, uh, and, and, and chairs will will you know manage debate and discussion. Um, uh, one of my colleagues um, uh, has uh, done master's research, fascinatingly, into political theatre in committees in, cabinet, in, in, in councils. Fascinating thing about sort of, you know, that the committee is a stage and councillors as actors and playing out roles and playing out a part. And the fact that uh, as an observer, it's often, uh, certainly coming from my background as an officer, you get this kind of situation where you're sitting there as an observer and you get councillors having these kind of or to almost pre-rehearsed arguments with each other and things get very, very heated mm. but then that, that, that heat sort of suddenly dissipates when you move on to the next item mm. and it's because people are, are playing out a role it's kind of what's expected of you in that context as an opposition member in a decision making committee it's expected you get angry about a decision even though you know it's going to have no impact or effect at all <laughs> because you're sitting there and you think well you know it's so that I can go it's back to my branch or so I can go back to my community and say you know I, I said this at committee you know, I, got, I got really annoyed about it and, and that kind of thing it's, it's important to recognise that you know um, 
it, you need that space for political fix. You need that space mm-hmm. for a political safety valve. And sometimes committees can provide that. That's not necessarily always going to be negative, but you've got to kind of recognise this is this is happening, and the need for the political safety valve and the political fix sometimes will work against the need for effective policy development and decision making. So mm. that's a challenge that you have to work with under the committee system. And it's also a challenge that you have to work with under the leader cabinet because you've got to provide that political space mm. for that to happen. So it's just that under the committee system there's more of an inbuilt opportunity for that to happen through a committee. But that's that's an interesting dynamic that's often mm. overlooked. No, that's the the formal development of politics is mm. indeed is, is indeed integral. And also is the part of political in some sense. And I just wonder whether you might make some comments about how party politics and its different manifestations is played out in these different models of government. Do you think that it has different effects in different contexts? Again, it, it's down to political culture and organisation, culture and individual councils. So mm. much. Um, so I think Barry Curtis, of course, uh, there is a long heritage of no uh, control. Uh, indeed, of yes. yes. So, um, uh, and, and political balance sometimes makes a difference, but sometimes it doesn't. Mm. So you get councils with an under overall control where um, uh, you know, discussion at committee and that political element is very makes things very very spiky. It's very, very politically charged. Some other councils under over control have a much more consensual working culture mm-hmm. because they've realised that over over the years that's the only way you can work. But that comes down to individuals and leadership positions within the authority recognising this and almost leading leading that culture within the council. Equally, um, uh, you know, under uh, under leader cabinets. Um, uh, you can have, uh, you know, uh, one-party states um, that that kind of uh, dominant party do- states. dominant party states, or, or you know, I mean, there are some councils with with only a single party holding all, all seats, and uh, so that's depending on how the leader and key councillors behave. There, you can get um, very dictatorial approaches where um, there's no dissent expressed in, in public at all. Or you can get approaches where the leader recognises, well, I've got opposition within my own group. Mm. I need to provide the space. And I have the confidence to be able to provide the space in public for dissent to be voiced and aired. And I know that that will, will help um, to build a sense of consensus and a sense of you know, agreed vision within my group. Mm. And it's what we need in order to be, uh, to be an effective working group together. So it all comes down, down to that. So politics expresses itself in, in unusual ways, in unpredictable ways um, as well. And that has an impact for a surprising number of years as well. So mm. going back to my first authority I worked in, which was Westminster, late 80s. Um, I wasn't working there then, but obviously the scandal over the homes of votes and Shirley Porter and all that kind of thing. She ran the council in a, in a particular way. <laughs> um, I started working there nearly 15 years later. But... That, that kind of political culture and that, that, that approach to, you know, forceful and, and effective decision making is a strong, you know, thing still pervaded the way the authority w- was run. And mm. that has positive impacts because it means that you've got a leadership with a strong and decisive vision prepared to push things through. But on the other hand, it means that when dissent is kind of minimised and when alternative voices are, you know, can be dismissed, uh, you know, there is that, that tension there. And that, that culture was something which was you know, had built up in Westminster over those years, um, that evolved and grew and developed and matured over that time. But again, it's, it's the, you know, the historical background is something that's really important to think about. And even things that happened 20 or 30 years ago, councils have very, very strong institutional memories, and that, mm. you know, pervades how you operate and behave now as well. Mm. Do you think that, that then affects the relationship between the institution and the citizens in terms of local democracy and the way in which they engage in local democracy? There's different cultures have an effect on the extent of engagement and participation and the time. Yeah, um, absolutely, because it affects how councillors behave, it affects how senior officers behave, Mm. and it affects what their expectations are in how they should be having conversations with the local community. Um, So, uh, you know, often in councils that have a, um, I suppose, a, a strong sense of political leadership, uh, again, you know, you can have that. That can be directly informed by open and you know discursive conversations mm-hmm. with local people. Equally, it can be informed by the views of a very, very small, select group of the of the executive who are driving forward this vision, saying, "Well, you know, we've been elected to do a job. What's the point in constantly going trying to go back and validate everything we do in the local community? This is a representative democracy. We need to drive forward and do this." So. Um, 
again, it's down to the personalities of individuals, uh, the individuals involved. You know, mm. you, you go back to the sort of, um, uh, I suppose, you know, back, back sort of looking back to 10, 20 years or so, uh, there was, I suppose, a culture in many councils of having uh, these kind of big beast style kind of senior officers, chief officers who were, you know, strong men, kind of chief officers of the old school, um, who, who were co- convinced about the rectitude of what they were doing and uh, people who were often in post for a long time, people who often worked in the authority for a long time, so it was steeped in the authority's culture and, and convinced about the, uh, uh, you know, that they knew and understood mm. the, the authority in the area inside out. And that approach worked against um, what was, I suppose, developing in the 90s and in the last decade about an understanding of the need to go out and have more meaningful conversations with people. I think in the last 10, 15 years or so, there's been more of a movement of senior officers between councils, uh, more than I think was the case, because opportunities for internal promotion lessen. Mm. Um, it's easier to, 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 you know, to move up at the, by, by moving from authority to authority. So that, that uh, you know, homogenous uh, co- officer culture within councils starts to break down and you start to get to new, new approaches get brought in mm. so that, that that's changing I think as well, well that's interesting it's far more fluid situation I think so, yeah. 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 Uh, you've got lots and lots of different point, uh, points there can I just come back to one about the decision making process the yeah. cabinet mm. and, and how the public perceive it because you know and I know say we're the cabinet sat around the table the girls are our papers we're well aware of what's happened or the work that's being put in by officers and colleagues yeah. prior to that, this decision being made. And all the public see, although it's televised, they'll see a sheet of it yeah. for, uh, da, 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 this is on the agenda mm-hmm. item today, we're going to close a library yeah. uh, in, in Golka. Mm-hmm. All in favour, gone. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And the public out there don't get to know all the background all the, the, the depth of discussion, all the length of time that's been spent on preparing these papers and, and the turmoil that the, the members have gone through mm. coming to that decision. How do we address that? Uh, well, <laughs> you, you know, you know yeah. where I'm coming from. I, do, I completely understand, yes. And I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a real challenge, particularly with councils facing the enormous financial challenge they do now. Councils are mm. making more of these highly contentious decisions often more quickly than you might like and often you feel well you know how can we introduce the local community to the idea that we've got to make some almost impossible choices here um, you know the, the idea of the financial challenge affecting local government being so immense uh, how do we draw in the community and, and I suppose make them aware of, of, of these difficult decisions that we have to make uh, and how can they help us to prioritise between these different uh, you know you know decommissioning service X, closing service Y. Um, and some councils have tried to grapple with this by you know, running uh, budget consultations um, which, which, which invite and challenge local people to say, you know, the council's got to save X amount of money. How, what would you, how, you know, having tools on the website to say, you know, you've got to save X amount of money. You know, here are some sliders. You know, how much money would you take away from service X? How much money would you put in service Y? And the implications of it, though. <clears throat> yes, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. This is what would close. This is what would stop doing. Yeah. This is what would you protect? What would you close? What would you? But uh, often that leads to situations where the public will say, "Well, you know, we wouldn't close anything. We, you know, we, we'd we'd somehow you know keep stuff open, or you know, because uh, councillors are elected to." Um, have that, I suppose, and certainly executive councils are elected and, and uh, sit on cabinet and they develop a strategic sense of the community of services and, and it, it becomes easier for you to weigh these things up because you have these conversations with officers all the time. For the public who sit and live within their ward, their community, their neighbourhood, who are going to have a, uh, uh, I suppose, a, in some cases, a visceral connection to a certain service or a certain facility or immunity, they're not going to see those in your offices. I don't think it's necessarily reasonable we should expect them to uh, to kind of behave in this kind of almost Athenian kind of way where mm. they're able to kind of weigh up things and, and that somehow it's the community's problem if they're unable to see the challenges that you're, we're facing in local government. I'm not sure how we square that circle, frankly. 
I just think that it's unreasonable for us to expect that we can somehow go out to the community and say, well, no, look at these difficulties that we're facing, look at the problem. This is the challenge that we're facing, so we've got to do this stuff. Um, uh, I think some of it is about how that debate is framed. I think some of it is about how prepared we are to enter into a long-term com conversation with the public about this stuff. And also some of it is about how willing the public are going to be to engage in a long-term conversation about this stuff. Because it's easier to engage and involve yourself in a campaign when you're having a campaign about stopping a library being closed or, you know, or, you know, a particular thing which is going to have a tangible direct impact on you as a local person. But when it comes to having a longer-term debate and discussion about stuff which some, sometimes will seem a bit intangible, esoteric, it's much more difficult to engage and involve local people in that. You know, you look at... Um, you know, two examples, um, uh, uh, sort of development of local planning policy is an obvious one. Um, when councils are developing um, development plan documents, or yeah. documents associated with the local development framework. Which we're going through now. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's very, very difficult to get <coughs> large numbers of, you know, large amounts of public feedback on things like the core strategy, because it's a dry, endlessly dense document. Um, even though it's going to directly affect individual planning decisions. Mm. But you will get big public you know, flashpoints over you know, development site X here, and the public will argue against it, saying, well, you know, why is this going through? And councils will say, well, you know, we've agreed in the core strategy that this is a priority. These, these are planning policies that we agreed, and we have to adhere to them. So it, it's, it's, you know, and, and so I suppose, I suppose the second one might be uh, with the NHS. A sustainability and transformation plans going through at the moment. Consultation over those has been minimal to non existence. Um, but they will have a profound impact on how services are varied and redesigned in local areas. So when that comes to happen, the public will say, Oh, why is this happening? And the NHS and councils, who kind of effectively kind of jointly own the STP, will say, Well, this was agreed as part of the STP, which was consulted on. The, cons the consultation may have been inadequate, but it was consulted on, and this is the approach that's been taken. It's been signed off and agreed with DH, and this is the approach we're taking. That's it. So it's, it's, uh, and that's why, even though we, we've listened to local people, yeah. we have overview and scrutiny yes, uh, yeah. uh, with the local authority and the NHS, and we refer it to the yeah. Minister of State, yes. yeah. and the Minister of State says, Yeah, get up, you're having it. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. I suppose, the, the public understanding what the limitations are within local democracy, the limitations of, of what they can and should expect. Um, but on the other hand, I accept that's a slightly kind of gloomy kind of position mm -hmm. where we're almost talking about managing decline in local democracy and managing decline of local government of saying, well, you know, it's about getting the public used to the idea that parks are going to close, that libraries are going to close, getting used to the idea that the council's going to be doing less in the local community, mm -hmm. that they, can, they can't expect more, that they have to expect less and less as the years go on. And as a localist, I, I instinctively dislike that idea, frankly, that all that we're doing is preparing the public for a gloomy and more dismal future of, of how their local community is going to look. I, I think that's not what we should be doing in local government or with local democracy. I think, you know, surely you know, it's, it's our job to be trying to define and direct and get the public enthused and excited about a, a more vibrant and exciting and brighter future. But how do you do that? I, I, do I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just explore that a, a little bit because, um, I mean, some of the conversations we've had, uh, I mean, uh, Roger um, Bushlin on Monday from uh, the Staff College talking about that, you know, the, the, the spectrum between representative decision making, participatory, whole yeah. spectrum. So you're going from the very the traditional, the councillor says this, the cabinet member says this, yeah. to actually involving communities. I mean, to, from your experience, so in terms of councillors as leaders, whether that's in the, community, you know, in the communities of ward councillors, actually does engagement with a community lead to better, better decisions being made, better understanding of whether it's about health or whether it's the local library. And there's two ways of doing that. You, could, you, you engage with communities on difficult decisions, recognising that still a decision has to be made, yeah. or you actually think, well, I know I'm still going to have to make a decision, so I'd sooner not talk to the public about it. I think... We got, so it's about examples of where mm. you've got councils really engaging in difficult situations. Mm. And does that lead to better decisions being made or better public understanding of the decisions being made? Yeah, I, I think it's it's difficult to think of you know direct examples, good examples off the top of my head, really. I mean, a lot of councils going through this process at the moment right. are trying to involve and engage. 
local people in, in these decisions and trying to get feedback and insight, I suppose, from local people about what they want and expect. So when, um, particularly when you're looking to commission services in, in new and different ways, when you're specifying how services might be delivered in the future, preparing to contract out, enter into a relationship with a commissioner, a commission provider for a long period, part of that process involves needing to go out to your service user group and talk to them about what services they want to need, because otherwise you can't write the specification effectively. So there's a prima facie kind of requirement to do that so then you can't not um, for other things as well I think you know as a councillor you're kind of elected to do that really I mean you're going to do that as a, as a matter of just your, your day to day ward work you're going to be having those conversations with other people about those challenges you can't fail but to be influenced mm. by those conversations as you come to make decisions yeah. so some of that will be formal through council structures through consultation through dialogue through conversations that are kind of led by and involved with the local uh, the council, but a lot of it will be led by your political activism at local level as well. When you're door knocking, um, you know the conversations you're having with local people. When you're running surgeries, when you're bumping into people in the street, the stuff that's bubbling up through those systems will inform the approach that you take. It's interesting the insight that you, because I, um, um, one of the benefits of, of um, not being in a job that's politically restricted anymore means that I, I can now <laughs> go back to being active in, in a political party at local level, which I, I used to do, uh, which I stopped doing when I got a job <laughs> local government now, and start yeah. doing it again. And uh, it's interesting what a different uh, looking and, and, you know, and doing door knocking and having those conversations yeah. with local people and seeing councillors having those conversations with local people as well. Having those conversations at branch meetings, uh, mm. talking uh, councillors, uh, talking to each other about these challenges, about these issues, and when you've got a cabinet member as a ward councillor, seeing how those conversations that they have at local level they influence and direct the decisions that they are trying to develop and, and yeah. form at, at, at authority wide level, it, it provides you a really, really interesting and different viewpoint to the viewpoint that you get as a council officer where you don't see all that stuff happening at local level. Yeah. You're almost not aware that stuff's happening. But that, that drives so much of the, I suppose, the political leadership, the authority, those, those kind of soundings, those informal stuff, that there's inchoate stuff that comes up from mm -hmm. local level, how you form it into something that's a... And that, that's, that's, the, that's political leadership, fundamentally. It might be worth, I mean, just going back to previous bits, because there's a couple of issues, I think, really come up that with, with, around the schools. There's the schools for the future stuff which John Smithson and mm. uh, Ken Smith led and I don't know, I think it was a nine hour cabinet meeting I right. sat through and that was very much engaging with people. I think the other one that's worth looking at at some stage is the RM grills that again both schools, looking at schools closures and mm. it was actually stuff mm. that was a very difficult cabinet meeting but there was stuff that came out of the cabinet meeting that was going on in the school that members of the public were not aware of right. And that it was difficult. That engagement. So there might be some examples we've got of okay. that type of community engagement we could bring in. Okay. Sure. Thank you. We talked about public engagements, but um, when you actually the ways that we engage with the public are obviously I'm talking here from a council point of view rather than a councillor point of view. Mm -hmm. But we run roadshows when we want to get residents' yeah. opinions. We have paper copies in libraries and accessible places. Mm -hmm. We have online engagements. Yeah. And we have, you know, obviously the councils are equipped with things as well. But I can't help but thinking a lot of it is actually when you look at the documents, they always look so formidable mm. because it's strategic, there's implementation, this, and it's just, it's not a friendly language. Mm. And I just can't help but think that's, um, that doesn't help people actually engage with yeah. the council. Um, a, a good example is perhaps I've got a friend that's a vascular surgeon. I know that he operates on people and has something to do with veins, but that's about as much as I understand. Um, but if he actually wrote it in a very, you know, you've actually got to go back to that language. And if he actually wrote, well, I made this cut here and this is what I did next. And I think almost we need to go right down to that level. And I certainly don't mean that as anything offensive towards the public. But we do talk in our own language. We do talk about strategic vision, transformation yeah. planning. It doesn't really mean anything to people. We yeah. actually need something that says, what do you think about this? And something that's just a bit more, more basic. Do you feel that that might actually engage the public more? And, I think there are two connected issues with to language. I think one of them is what you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the issue about you know, the words we use and, and not using jargon. And mm -hmm. we, we talk a lot in the sector about the need to use plain English in the way that we describe and talk about things. But certainly from an office perspective, when you're sitting within the organisation and you're writing stuff for internal, yeah. for, for internal view, 
in a certain way. And then you're sort of having to use different language when you're writing something for external purposes. And I think that in itself is a problem because I think it's assuming that there's an internal audience, an external audience, and that we should be um, you know, writing entirely separate material for both. Um, I think if we want to be more open about policy making, decision making, uh, stuff that we think we're writing for an internal audience, we have to, uh, we have to think about writing it for all audiences, mm -hmm. really. We need to, I, I think, um, think more about uh, the way that we uh, draft kind of research papers or briefing papers that sit behind decisions. You know, the stuff that's in cabinet reports is cited as kind of background papers at the end of the report, mm -hmm. which is, should be publicly available. Yeah. That kind of stuff to allow people mechanisms by which they can read kind of glosses of policies and information mm -hmm. that but they can also dig deeper if they want to and find information that they can read and understand and that they can use to become more informed. I think uh, central government is taking more small steps towards some of this through the work that they've done through the development of the gov.uk, so the portal, mm. which has tried to um, present more information about government policy in a more easy to read and understandable way and provide easier links to, to, to draw people into more detail if they want to need it. But I think even that very, very difficult to do um, uh, when you're trying to write for inter an internal audience. The second problem is the way that, by the use of language, we can subconsciously frame the way that we're asking people questions, asking the public questions about local services or local things they want, in a way that suits our needs as officers yeah. as well. So, you know, you know, you frame things in terms of, well, you know, these are the challenges that we're facing. These are the options that we have available to us. Um, these are the possible you know, decisions that we could make. Immediately, you're, you're, you're bringing the, the, the folks of the debate right in, and you're basically saying, saying to the public, you, know, you have to accept all the assumptions that we're making in this paper in order to engage with this debate discussion. If you don't agree with the assumptions that we've made, or, or what we've written here, then there's no real way for you to influence what you're doing. Because, so is there a way that we can almost try and bring in the public in into thinking about much more fundamentally what options we have or thinking about those kinds of issues. I think that's more, that is very difficult because that relies on almost, I suppose, passing, it relies on having a more, a more widely informed public mm. and a public who, who are aware of stuff that's going on, who are uh, sufficiently aware that they're, they're able to engage with those those vaguer initial conversations about about options and decisions. Um, I think one way of doing that for some areas of explore things like you know citizen juries mm. or citizens assemblies that can uh, you know where you're putting a lot of resource in into uh, getting and sitting down with a small group of people and you know skilling them up and developing their expertise and knowledge on a certain area through dialogue and conversation and then using that to have those conversations about options, but that's very, very resource intensive. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult and it involves selecting a, often a, a quite small group of people to engage with. Um, so that's difficult. But Which may be the people that will engage anyway. Sometimes it yeah. will be, yeah. yeah. Right. So it, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I mean, uh, there have been attempts to do this on devolution. So mm -hmm. there was a, a programme that was funded um, by, um, uh, through academic research grants that ran to sets of citizen assemblies one in Southampton, one in Sheffield, um, sort of over the course of a number of weekends last year. And that was an incredibly valuable thing. But the end result didn't really feed in in a particularly intelligent way to the devolution process that was ongoing. And it was also incredibly expensive. And you think, well, to engage with 40 people over the course of three weekends uh, in, in two areas of the country, uh, that's £60,000 per hour. Mm. You know, well, yeah. what's the return investment of that for the for the community, for the authority, for the wider area? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just out of interest, by the way, those two groups again mm -hmm. that were met, did you have any consensus about devolution and, and combined authorities and the mayoral system? Uh, it, it, yes, uh, some consensus emerged, but the, the issue is, was that consensus realistic in mm -hmm. the context of, of political pragmatism, I suppose? And that's the other difference. You know, you can you can draw groups of people together. Are they going to reach conclusions which appear to us as experts or practitioners or politicians to be realistic? So the one in Sheffield um, uh, reached the conclusion that they wanted to have a um, 
uh, an elected assembly for the area that had tax raising powers. Well, that's marvellous. It ain't going to happen. Um, but they were actually a big sign on the Yorkshire. A Yorkshire, a, York, a Yorkshire assembly. They rejected the Sheffield City yeah. region. I, I was part of the Sheffield. Oh, we <laughs> oh, were. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's um, and, and I think I think that kind of approach. I think really it, it does have legs. But I think we're we're very much on the on the nursery slopes in this mm. country of trying to understand how we build that form of very different form of participation into our into our existing systems, or how we try and rearrange and redesign our existing systems to provide more of a space for that kind of participation. Because at the moment, I I, I can't see how it gels with, mm. the, with, with the way that we we all do. It's about timing, it's about civic knowledge, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. about realism. I think the realism is interesting. Yeah, and it, that comes back down to those, the wider issues that we've been talking about for decades around th- civic participation, political education, this kind of stuff, the extent to which the public really understand mm. or have any kind of basic understanding of how decisions are made in their name at local level. Um, if I didn't work in local, you know, I'm <laughs> intelligent, if I didn't work in local government, I doubt very much that I have, have any real understanding how decisions made in local authorities, mm. uh, you know, what, what the division of responsibility is between local level and, and national level. Um, for a lot of people, it's, it's, it's irrelevant to their lives and, and they don't understand this and they don't really see a need to or want to understand it until something happens in the local community that directly affects them. You, you're saying that the people out there don't understand that the local authority, whether well, they appreciate the fact or not, touches their lives from the moment yeah. they're born yeah. to the moment they die. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 Is there, are, there, are there any examples of where some form of sort of public civic education has had a positive effect? Um, when local authorities have gone out and sought to actually engage with citizens in that way, it, 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 we're sort of we're, we are sort of moving away from my area here, so I'm. I'm hmm. I, I, no, I just think you are raise it. Yeah, I, I, I sort of. Yeah, you know, I've. <laughs> I've <laughs> been talking generalities about this kind of stuff, but when, when it comes to you asking me about no, no, exactly. it's, it's, fine. Uh, no, 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 no. it's difficult. Uh, yeah, I, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing comes to mind. Just just a, sorry, can, I, can I just touch on that tax raising powers just mm. for a second? Uh, I don't think the public are aware that uh, an elected mayor can raise uh, funds yes. to, to fund his own yes. office and his activities. Mm-hmm. How, how much is it? Do you, do you know, is it two uh, percent or something? It's, like it's that, easy. You can put an extra two two percent of the rates. You, you, you can. You can. You can council tax. Uh, yes, that's right. So there's a uh, there's a sort of additional social care element, isn't there, or something? I'm rusty on this. Hasn't so it can be more than two percent. I, I I can't. We need to explore that. Yes, somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Can, yeah, you need to get somebody in who's who's more of an expert in local government finance to uh, mm. give you a sense. Does that will have an impact on what people pay? Yes, yeah, obviously. Uh, yeah, and their annual uh, council tax. Just to yeah. sort of move on and um, just think about this idea of the role of the councillor in some sense, in the wider frame of debate about engagement. One of the things that when we were talking to local citizens that they came up very strongly with is this idea that they didn't feel that councils were held effectively um, for the decisions that they took mm. uh, and in that sense you know, this disconnect if there is one between citizens and local authorities wasn't simply due to a lack of engagement, the communication was mm. clearly an issue mm. um, to what extent on your own, for your own personal experience do you think that A, that is a problem and B, that communication could be improved I, it's it's difficult. I mean, I, again, uh, different in different areas, so mm. it's, it's difficult. I mean, I I think generally um, always councils and councillors can, can can be better at communicating and engaging. Um, I think uh, there's often a I suppose a, a reticence to. Um, uh, Around uh, around communication, because there's a sense that um, you need to be um, incredibly scientifically rigorous in how you do it, how you engage the local, the local population. You know, to get a, a kind of a, a wide range of views, to, to have those kind of conversations in a way that's kind of almost kind of more scientifically valid from a sort of research evidence point of view. Mm. Um, I think we should be prepared to be a bit more down and dirty with this kind of thing. And to be prepared to accept that 
communication between the council and, and the public is never going to be perfectly scientifically rigorous. You're never going to get a perfect cross-section of the community having those conversations with you. But, you know, you, you work with what you've got and you build on it and you try and do more and you try and tweak it and you try and involve and engage more people in those conversations. Um, I think councils that um, take quite traditional approaches to the way that they communicate, where the executive and senior officers and the council generally has a feels that they need a a I suppose a that strong corporate vision that mm. they're driving forward in the community and they're trying to almost kind of bring the community round to their way of thinking. I think that's going to become increasingly problematic. Mm. Um, it's going to come across increasingly as kind of remote um, and you know unaccountable and I think also councils don't have the resource for that kind of approach anymore, for, mm. that, for that minute level of message management that previously used to have with very, very large internal comms teams that, uh, and external comms teams that would drive forward uh, you know, the lines of messages about certain things in certain ways. Um, I th- I, I'm not sure, but you know, and again, we're, we're moving towards areas you know, on which I'm not a particular expert, but I think that's uh, looking at the way that councils engage in that way, it's, it's going to have to change. Mm. Yes. On that, on that very point, uh, government has told uh, local authorities, particularly those of size, that to stop publication mm. uh, because we have quite an effective way of communicating with every household. Yeah. Uh, in Kirklees, did we not, or do we not at the moment, uh, by sending uh, what, is it twice a year, four times a year we send them out? We send them out frequently anyway, but those are, uh, are going to be cut back severely because of cuts to government. Mm. Um, and the only other way that we can communicate then is by individual councillors sending out our newsletters, mm. uh, which can sometimes skew what the council does. Yeah. Because we're all, we're all political yes. in, yes. Our, yes. Yeah. Course, yeah. in our own way. Um, so I think perhaps that is another mistake, uh, but, but it's another dictat, is it not? Oh, we have to comply with. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, again, speaking as a localist, I think councils should be free to decide if they want to, if they see a, a value in communicating with local people in that way, they should be able to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's always struck me as unreasonable that government seeks to micromanage the mechanisms by which, by which councils seek to communicate with the public in that particular way. Um, and, and it, you know, there was a political imper- imperative behind it, obviously, and, and that. That's just where we are. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it, it just means that I think it, there's one less tool in the armory of the councils, basically, mm. in, in terms of how they how they how they engage with it. It's not you know, fatal. Um, and some councils, I think, would have a lot of councils would would have moved away from that approach anyway, even if they'd not been forced to, because for a lot of authorities, it became more and more financially difficult to justify. Uh, certainly, councils that did it fortnightly or monthly. Uh, they're trying to put something out to every, you know, house in the house in the borough. At that regular basis, it became financially impossible to do it. Um, but yeah, certainly, particularly for large, like large authorities, like we are. Yes, yeah, so precisely. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but it's a it, it, it's a obvious and you know clear way of trying to get that message out. And, mm. uh, and obviously, the, the quality and value of that depends on the language they were using in that in that publication. Of course, a lot of councils used it for kind of broadcast, for saying, this is how fantastic we are, look how great we are, all these great things that we're doing. Mm. Um, there are ways and means to use these publications to try and provoke more dialogue and more of a, uh, more of a debate. Mm. And, a, and a way of, that you described earlier, of getting the message through about the, uh, well, what we could cut in services yeah. Yeah. and yeah. things we can do and can't do and can do and can't yeah. do in the future. A- a- absolutely. You know, it provide, and again, it go, goes back to the point that I was making about sort of safety valves earlier. The more that you're able to it seems paradoxical that councils would, would want to flag up and say to local people, by the way, in the next year or two, we're going to be making all these awful decisions that you'll hate. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think there's a value in doing that because the earlier that the public are available, you know, the more that you're actively seeking to go out and talking to them about this. Um, and the extent to which you're kind of almost not sugarcoating it, but saying, we want to talk to you about how we can make decisions in a, in a way that actually makes things better, rather than it's just about managing the climate or sort of trying to make things less, 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 <laughs> less, less worse. Um, the more you're able to try and build a, a sense of consensus about what the way forward is, 
if the council is trying to keep its cards close to the chest and saying, we've got to manage this in a common set of terms, we've got to manage this politically, um, we've got to be, uh, you know, we, we can't have a you know, widespread public debate about this because there'll be a massive bump fight. Sometimes you need that bump fight in order to move mm. things on. But it takes a huge amount of political confidence to do that. Um, and you've got to be a, a, a particular kind of leader, a particular type of council, working in a particular type of community for that approach to work. I think there are some areas where it would be a you know enormous kind of enormous disaster, but you can see it potentially being an option. Um, for being, you know, if, you, if you're a visionary leader and you think, you know, if we open this stuff out, risky though it is, um, potentially there's there's the opportunity for us to build something better and bigger here. We have, to, I think, uh, we all realise you know, openness, transparency is is a must, uh, and, and I think people value uh, knowing mm. uh, what lies in store for them. They may not like it, as you say, yeah. but, but, but I think there is value in telling people out there mm. what's about to happen. It's, it's almost like Armageddon's coming, so you be prepared. Yeah. Okay. I don't just, yes. Yeah, I just want to move on slightly, Andrew, because I'm just slightly aware of time, and I, I, I do have to finish at one o'clock. Um, and in many ways, one of the reasons why the public scrutiny are um, so resonant in these debates around devolution and local authority, is, 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 is their engagement with the regional devolution agenda and the implications for local government, in some senses. Uh, and a number of reports have come out of which you have been involved in. Indeed. Indeed. Um, been very recently. Uh, with the context of that, it, 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 you know, one of the things that recently one of your reports said is, is that you know, local authorities need to consider what stage devolution process is. They currently stand in West Yorkshire, of course. Mm. There isn't any real yes. uh, sense about what's going to happen at the moment. Mm. Is it West Yorkshire? Is it going to be Greater Yorkshire, whatever that means, mm. Lesser Yorkshire, etc., etc. And, and then, then to evaluate, reassert what the outcomes of devolution mm. uh, will deliver to the area. All these things seem to be at the moment rather abstract because we haven't seen that deal signed in any sense yet. What do you think the implications of the Kirklees Council and the local authorities and widely in terms of governance accountability in the context of ongoing devolution and um, the emergence of some form of a combined authority yeah. and a potential move, although less likely you know, it appears under Theresa May, uh, for a uh, uh, the introduction of a elected elected mayor yeah. model. Yeah. I think the first thing to bear in mind with it is that in a combined authority, you're not creating an additional tier of government with all the addition, with all the sort of extra bureaucratic legal stuff that would go with that. So we're not seeing a recreation of something that looks like, you know, regional assemblies or RDAs with all the structures and, and systems that they involved. So I present, I suppose, on the one hand, for, for those of us who are not localists, that's a good thing because we're not pouring power into mm. big regional bodies. On the other hand, it presents a challenge for governance accountability because the government is very, very keen to keep these arrangements light and flexible and, I suppose, almost informal in nature. And I think there's a lot of logic behind that, but it presents a challenge for some governance because we need to make sure that within that flexibility and lightness of touch, um, there is still strong effective governance. Um, I think it'll, it, it is too easy to assume that we're just going to be able to transpose existing systems that operate at local level mm. to combined authority level. Like, for example, the requirement that uh, combined authorities will need to have um, open scrutiny committees. It is easy to say, well, they will just operate very similar way to the way that open scrutiny committees operate at local level. Mm. You'll have a combined authority on estimacy and it will sit and it will take reports and it will meet four times a year and it will do stuff. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And I think that that is writ large for governance generally. Um, there are ways that we do things at local level. There are ways that we make decisions, uh, that we develop policy, uh, that we work with our partners. Mm. That will not be the same at combined authority level, even if we really want them to do, because the nature of decision making will, by definition, be different. Mm. Um, the combined authority brings together a number of a far wider range of uh, local authorities, uh, state, you know, partners, and other actors in joint decision making. Um, it, it, it will make decision making more complex and, and more messy and it will mean that governments will need to look and feel really very different. Mm. Um, you may have the appearance of 
those kind of formal structures, like a you know, combined authority cabinet where leaders will come together periodically and they will make decisions. There will be you know, groups of, of, of leaders and cabinet members who will come together in kind of policy groups that will meet formally and sit around the table and talk about these kinds of things. But sitting behind that, the structure and nature of decision-making will look very, very different indeed. And I think we need ways of recognising this, recognising, I suppose, what information and data is fed in and fed out of those systems, mm. and then how we're going to use that information and data, open it out, uh, use it to involve a wider range of people in civil society, the public at large, uh, you know, voluntary sector, other partners, and backbench members in challenging, holding to account, um, uh, feeding in to the way the decisions are made, and making sure that it doesn't end up being a cabal of 12 leaders mm. who sit in a room with a selected group of partners, uh, you know, the NHS, the PCC, uh, your other statutory partners, mm. and who cobble and the LEP and, and sit and cobble together uh, decisions um, to suit their personal convenience. Because that, of course, has been one of the criticisms of many of the deals signed so far. I suppose two questions there. One is, 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 do you think that in itself has been damaging the way in which deal making is approached so far? Yeah. And two, how would a council such as Kirk Lees address those very issues of information openness, all the kids, when you talk about accountability? Yeah. I think, um, I suppose, the, the nature of the deal making process makes it very easy uh, to be kind of secretive about it. And there's something about the, the actual formal negotiation between local areas and government, um, government has specifically said to local areas, you know, don't publicise what we're talking about here. Mm. And there's no, in, there's no, uh, so for local areas, there is no real drive to do that because they don't want noises off as they're negotiating. They want to be able to have this conversation in you know, quiet. Kind of, it's difficult enough getting consensus amongst you know ten people, mm. ten leaders. You know, when you start opening that debate and discussion out to hundreds of people, hundreds of councillors and others in the local community, my God. Um, and I mean that presents its own challenges because you, you may get something that ten people in the room agree with, but you know that deal may not be necessarily something that a wider range of people would sign up to. So that that's difficult in itself. Um, but it's um, if you're, I suppose, if you're going to get deal making happening at the pace that government wants and expects, and also the pace that, to be honest, the, se the sector wants and expects, because the sector is looking at this and saying, you know, we want to take advantage of this opportunity, we want to keep the pace up. Um, it's difficult to see how deal making is going to change fundamentally. There's no real drive within the sector or within central government to say, oh, let's open this process out. Um, I think, as we said in our research, there are ways and means of trying to get a wider range of people to try and frame how initial proposals put to government. Mm. So I think that could make the process more robust. Um, but within the negotiation process itself, there's not really a huge amount of space for that to happen. Um, in terms of how you can think about how local areas can try and influence how this develops. Um, I think, I suppose there are a number of means for doing that. Um, I think there will be a need when, when and where combined authorities are set up for strong links and connections between local scrutiny systems in local areas and combined authority and scrutiny. And I think that, that link is a really, will be a really, really important one because it will be, that, that's the way to, to exert a strong and effective challenge on these kinds of governance issues within the combined authority. Um, I think also um, leaders will need to exert that challenge to the combined authority because they will need to build political capital back in that home authority mm. um, in order to have the freedom to do stuff with the combined authority. So they will need to be able to share information, share data, have that dialogue with their own political group, with other parties, with other local partners, in order to be able to go to the combined authority and make those decisions. So it's not really nice to have. There will need to be systems for the sharing of information, mm. systems for consistency over what do we agree is happening locally at the moment. One of the worries, certainly that I have, is that um, if you look at places like Greater Manchester, they have a history going back 30 years and more of all those councils coming together, sharing information, mm. sharing data, sharing insights and thoughts on what's going on, what the challenges are, what the priorities are for the community. Um, other areas simply don't have that history. So you don't have that data set, that, that information, that capacity at the combined authority level that draws together that information and says, on the basis of this, what do we need for the whole area? 
Um, and because of that, um, making deals is more difficult because essentially you're trying to condense greater Manchester's 30 years of work into eight weeks mm. where you're basically giving a couple, a, a few kind of senior policy officers uh, within the corporate core of a couple of councillors eight weeks to say, right, sit down and, and write a proposal that we as the councillors will then talk about and agree and then we'll put it to the government. And I think this is why the iterative nature of deal making is so important. Mm. These first deals are important, but all they do is they really set a direction of travel. So I, I wouldn't so I wouldn't place too much store on the initial deal making process that Eric is going through at the moment. I think much more important is the process that I think again, I don't want to use Greater Manchester example because they're very atypical. But if you look at them, they're on their fifth deal there. Mm. If you extrapolate it out and say other areas are also going to go through that iterative process, it's when you get to your third, fourth, fifth, sixth deal, then you are developing much more of a coherent and consistent sense at local level about these are our collective priorities. This is our vision as an area. It's not just, you know, flashy words on a proposal document. This is actually stuff that we've talked about over the course of a few months and years now. We know what we want. It means the area is going to be putting forward more ambitious and provocative bits to government, which are going to be far more evidence-based. Mm. And that, I suppose, is a more idealistic vision of how devolution is going to develop, because that says, OK, we're going to go from this, and it's going to accelerate, it's going to move on, it's going to become much more meaningful. And that means that as part of that process, you're going to get that development, that dialogue um, within the local community at large, which allows that, that those areas to come forward with those more provocative and ambitious bits. Um, and the only way you can do that is by sharing information, by agreeing on what those priorities are, by having that shared understanding amongst members, across, you know, the hun hun several hundred members across the area, mm. amongst the dozens and dozens of partners there are, about that collective vision. And that's very helpful. Um, Mr. Just one additional question I'll come to you, which, which, which one of the criticisms of these negotiations have been mm. is the level of public consultation mm. has been poor, um, both in, in, in its intensity, but also that it's been post hoc. Mm. And so really consultations haven't had any scope. The public doesn't really have any sense in which it can actually change the, the nature of many of these deals. Uh, to what extent do you think, A, because of what you just said, mm. is public consultation worthwhile? Mm. And B, um, you know, to what extent does that impact on public knowledge mm. of what is the intent and implications of regional devolution mm. on local democracy? I think consultation on, on devolution is a bit fool's errand because the public are not going to be interested in government structures at some regional level mm. because they're not you know normal people aren't interested in in this kind of stuff <laughs> frankly <laughs> what the public are interested in um, speaking as a member of the public um, is, is outcomes is saying this is the you know w rather than saying we're setting up this, this structure we're agreeing this thing called the devolution deal mm. do you agree with this devolution deal is having a conversation with local people about saying we want to do things to improve transport we're going to put in place these provisions to you know, increase the, the way that we deal with skills, employment, this kind of stuff. You know, even that is jargonistic. You can mm. still break that down into things that mean, make more meaning. And that's a way to involve and engage more people. Because if the public aren't involved and engaged in the outcomes that you're trying to achieve by devolution, then the outcomes that you're trying to achieve by devolution are probably wrong. Mm. Because they should be interested in those outcomes. Because if you're trying to drive forward transformative change through devolution, which is meant to be the whole point of it, is then it's going to be something which is going to have a direct impact on loads of people's lives. So focus on what that impact is going to be. What is that direct impact going to be? What's it going to look like? How is it going to directly affect people? And then use that as your way in uh, to local people. And, and that forms the consultation. I think the, the difficulty um, with the way that consultation has happened so far is because um, consultation is focused around the statutory requirements mm. in you know, the way that you've got to put together a governance review you've got to put together a governance scheme. Part of that involves an expectation that you're going to consult. So areas have consulted because there was a legal expectation they do so. And it's been, it's felt quite mechanistic. Mm. And I get, but I, again, I think the, the iterative nature of devolution provides part of the solution for this. Um, the speed of the initial processes have meant that trying to have that, you know, informed, reflective conversation about it, it was never going to have happened. It's all been a bit 
you know, slapdash and a bit quick, uh, uh, pacey. Um, I think we, I think areas need to accept that this, that they're going to need to improve the way that they do these things in the future. Mm -hmm. But I think the space and the time exists to do that. Um, I think it's not the end of the world that consultation has been a bit sort of all over the place. Uh, and I'm encouraged, by, frankly, by the fact that areas have tried to do those consultations. Uh, have recognised they need to be doing something, mm. but are also are also recognising actually the way that we're thinking about doing this at the moment probably isn't working as well as it might do. So we need to think about something different. I think again, you know, it means that we're at the beginning of that wider public involvement and engagement. Um, so consultation will get yeah. better as people get more experience. It will. So you know, the, the London Mayor example is quite a good one. If you look back to the um, referendum on the mayor in London in 1999. Um, a, a, a lot of work, a lot of work went into publicising the role, uh, powers, you know, etc., etc., of the mayor at that time. Turnout in the referendum was really low. It didn't enter the public consciousness. The first mayoral election in 2000, turnout was in like 35% or something. It was really, it was, it was very low. It's only really been, you know, it's, it's taken, it, it's taken, you know, 16 years for. The, the mayor's powers and the mayor in the public consciousness in London to really bed in. And in the, a couple of months ago, you saw a very, very high profile, uh, wide ranging campaign that got surprisingly high turnouts. So we shouldn't expect that we're going to be able to have this fantastic, marvellous dialogue on devolution mm. immediately. I think it's going to have to be a slow process by which the mayor, the powers of the mayor, the power, if they're in existence, the power and role of the, the combined authority. Mm. We do active work to ensure that that seeps into the public consciousness. We're constantly doing stuff to involve, to engage, open up this dialogue, to have this conversation. The mayor, if they exist, or the combined authority, is actively doing work to try and go out, to engage, to inform. But we shouldn't expect to get, you know, fantastic levels of input from the public. Uh, and we shouldn't necessarily be... be be sort of disappointed when we're doing all this stuff and the returns initially are quite low and we think, God, you know, this is this is a bit terrible, you know, this is having the result like, because it's a very long term game and we have to just plug at it and, and plug on. And over time it will I think grow and develop. And I think we've seen that in London recognising of course that again in London, you know, it's an atypical example and it's not how devolution works elsewhere. Well. Mm, that's enormous now. Sorry, Aaron. Um, I think you're quite right. Uh, I think um, there is a Perhaps it's a wrong expression, but a long game to play here. Mm. Uh, but how do we make um, so the five local authorities plus York mm. in, in the West York County Authority? And then we have to think for the monies that's coming in from government, the relet and the transport fund, we have to think strategically. Mm. So, how do I convince if I'm a, a, a leader on that bond? Mm. The mayor itself. Uh, spending 50 million quid in York yeah. and, and nothing in Kirklees. And, and after all the due diligence has been done and it's appreciated, it's good scheme, yeah. it will be trans transformational, yeah. it will make lots of difference to people's lives within the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, yeah. like jobs in, bringing jobs and investment, mm -hmm. and yet I've got to convince. Say yeah. a lot, or yeah. they have to convince Calderdale that it were a really good good idea. Yeah. That, that's, that, is, that is the difficulty, that is the central challenge to making it work. It's accepting that not everybody is going to benefit by every decision that's made within the combined authority and that some will lose out um, sometimes. You know, it's not necessarily always going to be a zero sum game. But what you've, got, what you've really got to say is, but, but collectively by the work that we're doing, look at the broad sweep of the work, not just individual decisions, and look at how collectively it benefits all of us. Um, so there may be individual things that will provide a, you know, a benefit to an area X um, over and above others. And a, lot of and a lot of investment and support will naturally be drawn in to areas, geographical areas that are recognised as a priority. So you're, you're going to inevitably have to deal with uh, you know, noises off from people saying, well, hang on, you know, all this money is still going to area X or area Y and we're, getting, we're missing out. But it's recognising that... Um, those benefits don't stop at the, uh, at, the, at the artificial borders of that you know, local authority area. Yeah. The benefits spread out across the whole region. That's why there's been such a focus on trying to ensure that, uh, that 
uh, de devolution deals reflect as far as possible kind of functional economic areas or travel to work areas, so that by interve intervening in that area, because it's a functional economic area, uh, intervention in one small area, one small part of it is going to have a knock-on impact across the wider range of areas. But mm. it, it, it's it's a nuanced and, and dry argument to that, frankly. And when it comes down to brass tax, I appreciate that politically it is going to be difficult to get people into the mindset that actually it doesn't mean that you're losing out if transport money is going into putting a load of money into. Like the little railway station at Bradford. Yeah, yeah. precisely. Well, exactly. I should push on with that because one of the things that came out of the Sheffield study was that identity matters in mm. these things. And yeah. obviously, the economic rationale doesn't seem to correlate with yeah. identity. Yeah. How, how important do you think that tension is between the two different drivers for a sense of citizenship? Yeah, it, it, that, that's really difficult. I mean, the geography is one of the more challenging points. And it's, it, it's obviously one of the areas where deals have ended up, or putative deals have ended up breaking down, has been that, that issue, that geography and identity. Uh, areas able to have, a, 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 I suppose, a, a collective sense about what's important to them as a, as a wide area. You said the geography is not just about the identity, it's about the difference in need, isn't it? So you look at somewhere like West Yorkshire, mm -hmm. and actually, mm -hmm. urban drives it. Yes, You've got yeah. huge chunks of the South Pennant. Yes. Which have got rural, which are yeah, pure yeah. rural, you heading up to the Peak District, and yeah. it's actually having a deal that delivers for the whole of the patch, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Give, all given that it might be in different degrees mm. across them. You're never going to have a boundary that's going to be perfect. Mm. Um, but you're, you're, you're just not. And, and I think, I think what, what's, what's going to end up happening is probably a kind of slightly messy approach, uh, whereby when more deals are in place, in those kind of what you might I suppose called kind of border areas, areas that that sort of um, might be more rural or sort of might face in, in, in two directions. You're going to get an overlap between neighbouring kind of areas in terms of joint working on on, on on those kinds of areas. And that's recognising that you can't easily draw a line and say, right, you know, you're looking this way and you're looking that way because that's not how mm -hmm. identity and communities necessarily work. Um, I, I think it is, that is that is difficult, but um, I don't think that functionally there's any other way of doing it because you've, you've got to have some system to say, you know, there's an area here that we're, we're working with. It's difficult to go another way mm. really of doing it. How do you slice it? There's always going to be a, a boundary. But well, given you said it's going to be messy, actually, some recognition from central government that actually lots of parts of the UK are messy and complex. Yeah. And there's an interdependence. Yeah, it's not as simple as Greater Manchester mm, or that, London that, in terms of dealing for it. That, that's right. No, I think in um, that, that that's that there's been an impatience from I think from government. I think about um, and I think from national kind of sector bodies as well, saying areas have just got to decide what direction to jump in. Mm. Um, so you know you've got to decide if you're in this area or in, if you're in this area. And I think in terms of the formal legal decision making kind of structure, I think that's right because you can't be I think it would be difficult to be legally part of you know, two different combined authorities. I think um, part of the answer to this lies in the whole difference, legal difference between constituent authorities and non-constituent authorities and combined authorities, because that allows for an element of overlap as well. I, I think we are going to have to accept that, um, that there is going to be some of that mess at borders, but I think that's a positive thing. Um, I think that's something to be encouraged because it's recognising economic reality on the ground. Yeah. So that's good. Um, it means that you're not going to have tight little maps that you can put on walls, but you know, I, I don't think that's a necessary problem. But Are you concerned that Derbyshire County Council is taking Chesterfield court over this kind of tension? Well, yes. I mean, it, it's. It, it, you know, uh, well, I'm thinking. Right, could, could we yeah, see a yeah. series of these kind of legal challenges? I, I, I think. I think it's possible. Um, I don't think legal challenges are going to get anybody anywhere because it's not really mm. going to resolve, fundamentally resolve any of this kind of stuff, really. Mm. Uh, I think you're going to get political disagreement. Um, I think you're going to get some areas, even ones that have done deals, potentially in the future, rejigging themselves. Should so government formulate some form of conciliation service to help this process so we don't see this kind of rather confrontation? I think, I think the sector should, possibly. Mm. I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong for government. I wouldn't right. like to see governments in the position of kind of sitting there and kind of chair meetings, arbitrating. Yeah. I think I think there should be a 
Uh, but I think, and I think there are systems within the sector, you know, led by organisations like the LGA for mm. cobbling together these agreements and knocking things together. And I think that's been happening on an informal basis. Um, but I think it is difficult because so much of it comes down to politics, to identity, mm. to a common vision, a common understanding about what's important to you. And it comes down to personality as well, because um, uh, and, mm. and how you've got on in the past, because there are areas where the district and the county in two areas never get on. Mm. And so this is being seen as an opportunity for some to kind of unitarise or, yeah. you know, deunitarise or, or whatever. And I think this is just going to have to shake down over the course of the next few years. I, I think there's no other way. You, you can't shortcut this process, I don't think, and it's going mm. to be messy. I think the problem is, will that necessary shaking down mean that government and the sector lose an appetite for this? And they say, God, it's just too difficult. It's too yeah. difficult. It's not bothering people. Uh, so the areas that have already done deals, the, the, the areas where, where there's an obvious combination of the centre, like West Manchester, like London, like to an extent in the West Midlands, will progress. And the difficult areas just won't and will go by the wayside. I think that would be a, I think that would be a, a mistake. Can, just uh, speed England. Yeah, precisely. I, well, I think, I, think there will will speed. I think there will be a multi-speed kind of approach mm. because deals will look different and different areas will define what their deals look like. But everybody needs to be moving on towards the evolution. I think it would be to do local people are disservice for areas just to sit back and say well you know this is just too difficult for us to do mm. uh, so we're, you know the, the prize is not sufficiently great for us to move down this road because the prize may not look great initially because those initial deals mm. look mm. like quite small beer 30 million quid a year for you know some fiddling around the edges on transport and skills it's not great but more, the more deals you do the more the you know the, the sort of the, the, the bigger the prize looks like. So mm. I suppose it's almost a sense of saying, what do you want this area to look like in 20 years' time? Um, you know, it, that, that, what's your ideal? And then how do you get to that? What are the stages that you might take over the course of two, three, four, five years to get to that? It's not a race. Mm. Um, let's take some small, defined mm. steps to, to, to do that. But having that long-term vision in mind and that being collective vision that you share with your partner, do you think central government has a clear idea of the 20 years or the strategic vision of where this is going? No, I, I don't. I, I, I hope. I hope not, mm -hmm. um, because I want this to be driven by local areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, if they did have a, a sense about what they want, how they wanted a sort of a, a rebalanced economy to kind of look like, or or um, uh, then 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 I'd, I'd be a bit concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit concerned that. Um, the new kind of national kind of industrial strategy may end mm. up leaching mm. in to government's expectations and it will start getting government saying well um, we have these eight priorities for example in our industrial strategy so all deals will have to will have to put forward proposals against these eight priority areas and I think when you start if you start to see that happening then that's your point of saying well devolution is is kind of falling apart a little bit because mm. it's becoming driven by the central government agenda. Yeah. What I far prefer to see is that industrial drought strategy being driven by the deals that are being done at local level mm. and those deals and the aspirations of communities and, and, and you know what's happening at local level and command authority level influencing what that industrial strategy ends up looking like and government saying how can we empower those areas, how can we empower these different parts of the country, how can we provide the space and the freedom mm. for those to do that without conflicts emerging uh, to provide this overarching kind of framework within which that freedom exists. Mm. Um, whether that would be what that strategy looks like, I don't know. But again, we're moving on. <laughs> we're moving away from my yeah, yeah, expertise. Yes. No, very interesting. Um, we are coming to time, so I think the last couple of questions. Because so unfortunately, I've got a classroom of students. Okay. Okay. Now, just can I just in that uh, um, the future mm. as it like yeah. with with the evolution? Uh, as you know, um, um, transport is a heart of everything that's yeah. driving devolution with with jobs in particular and, and the industrial strategy you've known. Can you see at any time in the future, if and when, that Yorkshire, West Yorkshire does get elected mayor or, or a, a properly constitutive authority, Manchester's nearly there, mm. you see the point? Because obviously we're talking about now Trans mm. about HS3, yeah. about having closer links pan northern, yeah. and whereby there is one northern if you like, combined authority? I think there may be, seems to be a need to cooperate on certain strategic, big strategic things, big major regional infrastructure things like that, I think definitely. 
But I think it's, it's, it's going to have to be you pick and choose according to your project, according to your subject area, what the correct level is. It's the principle of subsidiarity coming into play. You're doing the right thing at the right level. So for that kind of big transport project, then yeah, you might want to have something uh, that, that, would, that would help you to achieve that. Yeah. Uh, but there are more local transport projects where you think, well, it wouldn't make sense to have a big northern, pan-northern thing deciding on hyper-local stuff. Mm-hmm. So you've got to decide at what level. And I think that, that, that defines your governance and your scrutiny arrangements as well, because your governance and your scrutiny arrangements need to recognise there is this, uh, the, the, I suppose, the, the, the landscape uh, is, is much more complicated than saying there's this structure here and there's this structure here and there's this structure here, and mm-hmm. they, they, they operate in this kind of defined way. It is all going to be messier than that. So scrutiny needs to flex and change and evolve to meet those challenges. Uh, so, you know, for, for you know, if if you might have a situation where HS3 ends up being um, part and elements of delivery of that, so the infrastructure end up being you know devolved, then you might want to need to have uh, a way for councils and councillors to challenge and scrutinise and come to account the way that's being delivered. Um, but that would almost be a project by project and programme by programme basis. So you'd need to say, for those individual bits of work, those individual subject areas, how are we going to design governance to be robust without creating endless numbers of committees and boards that sit behind everything that require that councillors, are, all the councillors do is shuttle between Leeds, Manchester, uh, Sheffield, York all the time, going to various and boards and different meetings, and don't have any time to work in certain other communities. There's got to be a way of of, of, of meeting that challenge, but but until we know what those different structures and systems might look like and have a sense about what we, we don't really know what what governance will look like. Mm-hmm. What do you think the implications for local councils are going to be of the regional devolution agenda in terms of local decision making and their their resonance and role in local mm-hmm. communities? Well, I think, again, it comes back to subsidiarity. I think there's got to be devolution, not only to the mind authorities, but from the mind authorities down. Mm-hmm. There's got to be an acceptance that this is about, this has to be about. If devolution is going to be a success, it's got to be about devolving power all the way down to other communities. Mm-hmm. It's not about accreting power at sub-regional level. Um, so there's got to be uh, a driving role for individual councils. Mm-hmm. Uh, within councils, they've got to think of ways to push power down to the communities as well. Mm. If you've got a strong link between those local levels and the combined authority, I think the combined authority would be a success. If those strong links don't exist, if the combined authority is sort of wafting off in a different direction, mm. if it's trying to draw powers into it from local councils by saying, for example, well, let's just draw skill, all skills and our economic development yeah. uh, roles into the combined authority. It doesn't make sense that we all have separate skills and economic development kind of functions. Let's just draw it all into the combined authority for the sake of simplicity. And then you start saying, well, let's have a sub-regional um, solution to social care because economically, it's not economically viable to find care providers that will work mm. across a small area. So let's just do it all sub-regionally. And then you start saying, well, hang on, you know, this... this so that there's, there, there's, there's, a, there's perhaps a strategic role that combined authority can do to, to align, to provide a framework within which individual council, individual communities can act to do things that make most sense to them, mm. but in a way that means that all areas are kind of working together in a loose sense. Um, it's not about thinking traditionally about the need to agree everything together at one tier, otherwise nothing works. Mm. We have to accept the need for mix and the need for flexibility and the need for saying that different aspects of different services will need to operate at different levels mm. and for governments to recognise that as well. So for governments to operate at different tiers and different levels, and scrutiny um, to operate in that way as well. Oh, that's enormously helpful. I mean, the, the one thing that does concern me is the example of Scotland and Wales, of course, and the devolution of that centralisation. Well, exactly, and, and, and that, that's um, something we must avoid. Uh, that, because there, there, it is a natural tendency um, to, <laughs> to, to, to want to try to do that, because there's a sense of saying, well, we've got this structure at regional level now, wouldn't it be neater if we just threw stuff in here? Mm. And, it's, it's a natural human, I suppose, sense to, particularly for technocrats, um, well, I might probably class myself as a technocrat, <laughs> so in, order to, in order to be unpleasant about technocrats, uh, to, to say that, because there's a, there's a drive for neatness, for elegance, 
in decision making systems mm-hmm. for simplicity for what looks and feels to you as a decision maker like simplicity but it's not the way that that would appear to, to local people it, it wouldn't meet local need either so we must mm-hmm. recognise that well that's, that's enormously helpful thank you very much for your time and for your enthusiasm and your insight it's been an extremely enjoyable um, okay. it's not hard, I hope so. <laughs> we've all enjoyed that um, where we go from this is that we carry on for the next um, months taking more evidence. Yeah. Um, we then are being locked into a room until we can come out, <laughs> until the white smoke goes <laughs> out of uh, Kirkby's town hall. Um, we're very keen to make sure this commission doesn't follow the path that some do, which is that we engage with people, we give time and their ideas, and then the next thing they see is the report is produced yeah. and they feel. Where is that conversation? And this is a conversation. We will be drawing up a draft report and we're very keen for all our stakeholders and those that have been involved in the inquiries to feed back on right. those recommendations. And um, I'm sure that whatever we, uh, uh, what conclusions we draw and recommendations, that your input will be enormously valuable. You've brought great insight and we've really thoroughly enjoyed um, your time with us. So thank you very much again. Thank you. And we shall be in touch. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.